Hey, future doctors, welcome to Dentitionary here. Here we will be provided with information for the doctors from the doctors. Today, we will be learning about oral mucous membrane. So, what's oral mucous membrane? It's a membrane in our oral cavity, which lines our oral mucosa. Okay, the pink lining you see in your mouth, it also contains the tongue papillas and all the sides, the cheek epithelium, the lips epithelium and all. These all, con the, uh, it's a consistence of the oral mucous membrane. So let's start. First of all, the classification based on fictional criteria. These are majorly three types, masticatory, lining or reflecting mucosa, and a specialized mucosa. Masticatory mucosa is found on gingiva and heart palate. Okay, <clears throat> this is called masticatory because the masticatory forces are directly applied on these structures. Okay, on these structures. Then lining or reflecting mucosa. These are present on lip, cheek, vestibular, fornix is like vestibules if you have studied in your dental materials class, the landmarks. And that vestibules are there. Okay. The lingual vestibule, labial vestibule, alveolingual sulcuses, and all. Alveolar mucosa, floor of the mouth, and soft palate. Okay. Specialized mucosa, these are dorsal of the tongue and taste buds. These are what we're talking about about the tongue, the taste buds, or we call them papillas. Okay. We will be studying them in the further lectures. Okay, then on the basis of type of epithelium, on the basis of type of epithelium, it is keratinized and non keratinized. We will be studying them in detail. Escape functions, defense function, the integrity of the oral epithelium is an effective barrier to the entry of microorganisms. So, just like our skin, it is the first defense mechanism of our oral cavity and it as a barrier between the internal environment and the external environment of the body. Infection occurs if the epithelium integrity is broken down, or we will call that ulceration or any other things, cuts and all, resulting in bacterial invasion, or if their toxins are allowed to seep through the epithelium when there is a cavity. You can see when there is a cavity in your tooth, your tooth will be affected and then it will affect your pulp and that will affect your alveolar bone and mandible maxilla and all the systemic activities. The oral mucosa is impermeable to bacterial toxins. That's why it's put its protective layer. It also secretes antibodies and has an efficient humoral and cell immediate immunity. So it helps also in the fighting with the bacterial toxins so will it will keep our oral cavity clean and protected lubrication the secretion of salivary glands keep the oral cavity moist and thus prevents the mucosa from drying and cracking thereby ensuring an intact oral epithelium so lubrication is very important and we have studied these functions of salivary glands in the salivary gland video so you can just revise it from that video Sensory, the oral mucosa is sensitive to touch, pressure, pain, and temperature, just like our outer skin. Protection, it protects the deeper tissues from mechanical forces resulting from mastication and from the abrasive nature of food stuff because it's impermeable, so it resists the abrasive nature. And from protection from mastication, it distributes the masticated forces along with its axes. Okay, their axes, and it distributes it evenly and thoroughly. This is a whole chart of classification. Okay, you have to make it in your prof exams. If the classification oral mucous membrane comes, you will get a good marks for these flow charts. Oral mucous membrane, first of all, the epithelium, which we have non-keratinized and keratinized, and these are further classified as these. These are the layer in these epitheliums because these are histological features and structures. Basement membrane. This contains the basal lamina, the ultra structure in which it has lamina lucida and densa. Then the connected tissues, lamina propria and some mucosa. You have to make this low chart. It's very important. This is a general structure of this. Okay, the opening of duct and all. 
nerves going in then trapezoidal nerve endings this is the conified layer the granular layer which have granules the conified layer spinosum corneum and granulosum this will be we'll study in the later part prickle cell layer the basal cell or the basement membrane okay the capillaries of blood vessels lamina propria here this one is lamina propria this is some mucus layer which has which has some mucus glands arteries veins minor salivary glands nerves and all then there comes the periosteum and the bone bone will help in support Basement membrane and basal lamina. First of all, we will talk about the support. The main support is basal lamina or the basement membrane. The interface between the connective tissue and the epithelium in a light microscope appears thick and it includes the reticular fibers. This can be the definition of the basement membrane. This one. It is a zone that is 1 to 4 picometer wide and relatively cell free. This zone stains positively with the periodic acid skiff method indicating that it contains neutral mucopolysaccharides glycos glycos amino amino glycans ultra structurally the basement membrane is called the basal lamina okay which is not just a membrane but is a basal complex consisting of lamina and fibers the collagen fibers basement membrane promote differentiation or the proliferation of the cells it also promotes Peripheral nerve regeneration and growth, and they tend to prevent metastasis. Okay, it's very simple. The basal lamina is made up of a clear zone, lamina lucida, because it does not contain cells, so it appears very blank, just like this. Just below the epithelial cells and a dark zone. Okay, beyond the lamina lucida and adjacent to the connected tissue. So this layer is near the connected tissue. Lamina densa, anchoring fibrils. See, anchoring fibrils, which contain type 7 collagen, form loops and in, are inserted into the lamina densa. Okay, then collagen fibers of type 1 and 2 run through these loops. So it's like type 7 create loops and one and two passes through these loops. They go to inside and then the outside or wherever they are. It contains type 4 collagen coated with heparin sulfate in a chicken wire net like appearance. Okay, configuration. Lamina lucida. It is a 20 to 20, 20 to 40 nanometer wide glycoprotein layer and it contains type 4 collagen and an antigen bound by the antibody KF1. It has been shown to contain laminin and bullous pamphigoid antigens. This is very important. You have to remember it, bullous pamphigoid because in the oral pathology of third year, you will be needing this. Laminin is a large triple chain molecule, okay? The laminin and tri-4 collagen promote epithelial cell growth. So it promotes the epithelial growth or it can help in the regeneration of the epithelium. Found below the epithelium, the lamina propria, or in the connective tissue, the lamina propria has two parts, papillary and reticular. Papillary portion is the projection of connective tissue into the epithelium. Uh, as we can see, the epithelium is like this. Okay, so the projection which goes in these notches are the papillary ones okay so here are the papillaries an increase in the length of papillae seen in areas where additional mechanical addition is required between epithelium and connective tissue like masticatory mucosa where do we find that in the hard palate and the gingiva okay gingiva reticular portion is present below this layer the papillary one okay this contains mainly collagen fibers and blood capillaries interlocking arrangement increases the contact exchange area to facilitate material between blood vessels and epithelium so it increases the nutritionality of the oral epithelium because it's a connective tissue so it connects the bone periosteum or 
blood vessels to the epithelium so it will remain healthy and wealthy wealthy of the nutrients contents of lamina propria the ground substance fiber collagen and elastic fibers cells this contains fibroblast mast cells and inflammatory cells blood vessels and nerves then comes the submucosa it is a connected tissue of variable thickness okay serves primarily as an attachment for lamina propria to other underlying bone or muscle it contains glands adipose tissues vascular and vascular and neural components so it contains salivary glands blood vessels lymph vessels or lymph nodes nerves and adipose tissues for the fat resorption it has several histologic features that differentiate it from non keratinized epithelium okay the keratinized ones we have started the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium it is different from the non keratinized how we will study that later for distant layers can be appreciated histologically stratum basale or the basal layer is the single layer of cells that is seen in opposition with the basement membrane so its opposition in the basement membrane it is made up of cuboidal cells which actively proliferate and move forward towards the surface so it increases the thickness of the epithelium the thickness of the epithelium stratus spinosum or the spinous layer is made up of polygonal cells okay polygonal cells are like these cells which goes like this and the nucleus are here okay that gradually becomes larger as they progress towards the surface these cells are also called acanthocytes during routine tissue processing and preparation for microscopy the cells shrink slightly and their intercellular bridges are called desmosomes these help in communication with the nerves become visible easily <clears throat> stratum granulosum or the granular cell layer it contains the granules contain two to three layer of flattened cells that have very characteristic dark basophilic granules these are the keratohyaline granules okay the keratohyaline granules these all structures are very important for oral pathology and the pathology general pathology also which play an important role in keratin formation so why the keratin is different from the non keratinocytes or the keratin stratified squamous epithelium is different from the non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium because it produces keratin it forms keratin okay stratum corneum or the corneal keratin layer is the most superficial layer made up of flattened cells that we have seen in the uh, previous structure that are devoid of almost all organelles two types of keratin can be distinguished orthokeratin and parakeratin what's that orthokeratin is made up of flattened cells that contains no nuclei in the corneal keratinized epithelium and have a prominent granular cell layer so in this layer corneum layer which differentiate the orthokeratin from the parakeratin how it contains flattened cells flattened cells that contain no nuclei here is no nuclei but no organelles also but it has granular cell layer so these are granules in them okay orthokeratin is made up of flattened cells that contain no nuclei ortho is seen in hard palate while parakeratin is made up of flattened cells that contains few pycnotic nuclei not the normal nuclei the pycnotic nuclei the granular cell layer can't be appreciated here or not clearly seen in the light microscopy parakeratinized epithelium is noticed commonly in the gingiva so this one is in hard palate and this one is in gingiva okay so you can see the histological structure of the orthokeratinized the corneum there see the corneum there it is different you will see that again this is your basal lamina okay this is our papillary and this is our reticular connective tissues the spinosum layer stratum basal spinosum this is lamina propria lamina densa and all these things this is the stratified schematic diagram so you can see clearly the flattened cells with some granules here 
okay we have to make it like make it like this crato highland granules these are more highlanders so these are dark in color and these are light in color the spinosan ones and this is the stratum basal of yours the basement layer this is the navina propria developing vessels collagen fibers okay this is parakeratinized stratum corneum as you can see here is different okay and also the structure of the basal layer is different as you can see here the stratum corneum is more advanced as you can see there the structures flattened cells with a pycnotic nucleus and in the previous slide we will not see it in the orthokeratinized now the non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium here it is less distinct first of all singular of cuboidal cells stratum basal or basal layer is evident above this there are polygonal cells that are gradually flattened towards the surface so when it goes up towards the surface the cell becomes more and more flattened so the cell divided arbitrarily into two layers intermediate or the intermediate layer is made up of predominantly polygonal cells predominantly or mainly but stratum superficial or superficial layer contains flattened cells that have nuclei okay so it only has three layers the basal the intermediate and the flattened cell ones superficial <clears throat> as you can see here the flattened cells in the schematic diagram these are mainly polygonal cells and this is the low cuboidal cells or of the stratum basal these are adipose tissues and this is the lamina propria that's all for this part stay updated for the next part thank you so much for listening to me i hope you found this video useful if you want the ppt follow the link below and if you have any doubts or queries about these videos please comment down below we will try to solve it as soon as possible thank you so much